Uh, good evening and welcome uh, to the Center of Architecture. My name is Michael Simwellian with the Related Companies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the penultimate uh, lecture in an eight-week lecture series we've had celebrating the design and planning of Hudson Yards. It's my real pleasure, in, in fact, to introduce both Thomas Wilson and Vince Cipolla, who will be speaking tonight about the landscape architecture titled Everything Outside of the Building. I'd also like to thank the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, for their collaboration in programming this event. And for you landscape architects in the office, you can get credit uh, for attending this. Additionally, I'd like to welcome students from Fordham University who are in attendance this evening for this event. Uh, following tonight's event, um, you're all invited upstairs to the Breakthrough Gallery, if you haven't been up there yet, for an exhibition that we've had up since May 1st, celebrating all of the design and architects uh, and um, schemes that we've had for Hudson Yards. It's been an enormously successful uh, show. We've had thousands of people from the public coming in and looking at Hudson Yards in a very different way, and we're really thrilled uh, to announce, for those of you who don't know, that we're extending the show through Labor Day. So in case, uh, please talk to all your friends and neighbors about coming tonight. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about Hudson Yards, I think, is the fact that half of it is dedicated to public open space. Uh, and I think one of the most extraordinary things about the open space is that we have an extraordinary landscape architect on our team to help us envision that space. Uh, so I'm, you're all in for a treat tonight hearing Thomas talk. But before I uh, go any further, I want to introduce Vin Cipolla, uh, who's the president of the Municipal Arts Society. He's also president and CEO of the National Park Foundation, chairman and president of Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. He's the executive vice president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He's the vice chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He's vice president of Ballet Hispanico. And I cut out the other half of his bio, just so you know. Um, but thank you, Vin, and welcome. Good evening, everybody. It is, my, uh, it is my real honor to introduce Thomas. He doesn't really need an introduction, I don't think. But, um, and first, let me say that Thomas is on the board of the uh, Municipal Arts Society. He is the first landscape architect to serve on the board of MAS, as far as we know. And we've researched it. And we have found no others. And uh, Thomas was, uh, his career at MAS was advanced by our our wonderful devoted trustee, Kitty Hawks, who's sitting four rows behind Thomas. And I don't know if there are other MAS board members in the room, but if you are here, we are very happy to have you. Okay, this man, Thomas Woltz, was raised between a farm in North Carolina and New York City and is the son of an artist and an industrialist. He has a master's in both architecture and landscape architecture from the University of Virginia. He has uh, 18 years of practice in Virginia as a landscape architect, and he is now the owner and principal of Nelson Bird Woltz. He opened a New York office nine years ago and a California office in 2012. Nelson Bird Woltz is working in 25 states and nine foreign countries. It has been awarded over a staggering 80 ASLA and AIA design awards. It is the winner of the Amanda Burden Prize for Public Space for City Garden St. Louis. It was most recently awarded the National Sustainability Award of New Zealand, and Principal Arch Princeton Architectural Press published their recent book, which we'll be talking about tonight, Garden Park Community Farm. I give you Thomas Waltz. Uh, good, evening. good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming, uh, coming this evening to hear this presentation. Um, I first want to thank uh, Related for the unbelievable opportunity to serve them in building a landscape vision for this incredibly complex project. Our, uh, our office is, uh, it, it may be working in the many places that Ven mentioned, but not at this scale of urban infrastructure planning the intersection of trying to find urban ecologies, uh, the complexity of the engineering. It is, in, in a way, it's the kind of project your whole career is, uh, has been building toward. And it's really an honor to be entrusted uh, with this complex and, and uh, challenging project. We've been at it for one year, and I'd like to start right away by erasing the whole uh, Thomas Waltz, Thomas, 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 because there are 
uh, 10 unbelievable practitioners who work for Nelson Bird Waltz in the room tonight. And I'd love for them to just raise their hands. Um, many are up in the balcony. Come on, guys. Big, you know. <laughs> I get to talk about it, but they do it. So um, it's a really good relationship, and we kind of operate as a big collaborative family. Um, this, uh, this year marks a major turn for us uh, in publishing uh, the first book of our work with Princeton Architectural, Pro uh, Architectural Press. Um, we're very grateful to the press for wanting to do this project with us. Um, it too was a remarkable collaboration between artists, photographers, uh, writers, Stephen Orr, the editor, and Elizabeth Meyer, who wrote critical essays for each of the chapters. I wanted to um, make uh, just a few brief comments. I'm gonna walk you through four projects as a way of giving you a small glimpse into the range of our work. One of those projects, of course, is Hudson Yards with Related. And then Vin and I are going to have um, a highly unprepared and natural conversation in front of you because we just haven't really exchanged notes, but we, think it, we know each other well enough that I think it's gonna be a fun conversation. Um, the, the heart of the matter is really what makes uh, excellence in public space. That is our goal. Our goal is to serve Related, to serve our own mission of putting design excellence in service to restoration ecology, culture, and history, and to also build a wonderful, wonderful place for the people of this city. So the title of the book, Garden Park Community Farm, albeit cumbersome, was intentional. Um, it was actually the, the victory of a bit of a, of a back and forth with Princeton, who had the idea that it should be Nelson Bird Waltz Landscapes. And I thought, gosh, for people who do everything they can to excavate a sense of place, and how does this spot in the world tell you where you are? I always think back to Wendell Berry's famous quote, you don't know who you are if you don't know where you are. And I think a big part of our job as landscape architects is to stitch you to where you are, to reveal where you are in ways that are transporting and hopefully artful. Um, the book begins with gardens, so I thought I'd walk you through a garden, a park, a community, and a farm. So we'll quickly run through these images. This is probably the tiniest project we've ever done. It's a, it's a 25 by 32 feet uh, uh, um, in uh, the Upper East Side. It's a very small retreat for a family raising three children. At the heart of each project is the idea of narrative, of telling stories, telling stories that, that start to build this sense of place between people and the land they own. The idea here was a retreat for the family, but also uh, an ecological resonance with the wildlife of Central Park. So we started our conversations with the director of ornithology at the University of Maryland, who gave us a lot of data about what birds were threatened and that we could start to create an ecological echo or resonance with. So uh, uh, birdhouses, like little Donald Judd-inspired birdhouses, will be installed next year in the hops that are growing up cables. Um, this uh, tiny space was divided in this kind of diptych that relates to the inside of the house, and a screen of ginkgos brought forward just at the back of the house to start to create a layered space. When you look down from the dining room, you see the idea of nest that starts to uh, infiltrate or infuse the entire project. All the detailing of the woodwork, um, interwoven bands of, of wood that are cut to look as if they are, they are braided, uh, the large chair down below, um, this living wall where birds can build tiny nests in among the greenery um, with a sandbox for the three children at the base. When you get to the top, you have the sky meadow that are native warm season uh, grasses and perennials native to the state of New York, bringing a little nugget of meadow up to the top of this building. And you, like a bird, are immersed in this meadow that starts to cut out the foreground and just leave the skyscrapers and water towers of the neighborhood. Um, Seated, you're immersed in this little bosque of, of native trees. So that's a tiny project. Um, it miraculously won the ASLA Award of Honor last two years ago. Um, and I think because of narrative, because there was a story that, that took this little tiny place and allowed you to feel a psychological and, and um, virtual connection to Central Park. This is looking down from the roof. You have um, this kind of immersive, lush quality of this tiny garden. Moving to a park, I thought I'd show you City Garden. Um, this, was, this is not it completed, people. <laughs> Don't be mean. Don't. Um, 
The, uh, the area is uh, three acres. It's two entire city blocks. And the commission was for a, a public space uh, to host a 24 pieces of masterworks of contemporary sculpture, modern and contemporary. Um, who builds that? I just, I mean, you have the axis of the Mississippi River, the arch, the Capitol, and boom. So we, we weren't able to do much about that, but uh, this is the plan of the two blocks, and I thought I would use this project to walk you through our office's method, how we approach a project. Uh, we begin by looking back and forward at the same time. Um, this is a plan, a Sanborn map of, uh, you can see the uh, party walls that go between warehouse buildings. This was Market Street. This had been, uh, up until uh, 40 or 50 years ago, a thriving uh, uh, piece of the city. Um, there's an alleyway that runs, jogs, and has a very strange crank. And uh, one of those factors that goes into the hopper that you start to think about um, as you seek for meaningful design. Uh, next, we looked at the um, soil deposition patterns of the Mississippi River flooding, um, these exquisite maps of spirals and coils of soil deposits annually to the river. So that, that um, sinuous curvilinear shape being on the banks of the Mississippi started to be another design factor. Um, the geology that allows St. Louis to be where it is, this high bluff of layered limestone over the Mississippi River with streams and creeks from the upland that reach the edge and have this beautiful free fall across the natural layers of stone. This led to a diagram. Um, this project was led by my uh, business partner, Warren Bird, where this upland uh, became uh, really the need for dense shade and prospect. It's so nice in a very big public space to have prospect over the space. The middle started, came to represent uh, the Midwestern prairie and became our stormwater uh, infrastructure brought to the heart of the project and rendered beautiful, uh, exquisite, we hope. And then the lower portion, the lower third, is a series of gardens showcasing the native perennials of Missouri to try to really encourage homeowners and people to understand the beauty of the native flora. Um, you start to see the notion of the sinuous line that de developed into a quarter mile long seat wall um, of polished granite on the top that starts to evoke the, uh, the light reflectivity on the Mississippi itself. Um, in amongst this uh, design of the garden are places for uh, major works of sculpture. Uh, as is m most cases in our practice, we are hired first in this case as well. And then we're working with clients to hire the right architect for the project. So we do the land planning, the site planning, and then we begin the conversation about which architecture firms are the right fit. And we usually propose three firms and go through the interview, interview process with our clients. Uh, in this case, Phil Durham was selected, uh, did a magnificent job with the cafe, very large spray, uh, spray plaza for children, and a mount at the very upper left corner as a lookout. This was the garden uh, as it opened uh, July, a year, uh, almost two years ago. And you can start to see the pieces of sculpture peppering uh, the lawn. The collection was already established, so we didn't have the, well, my dream job is to work with the artists in a sculpture garden and collaborate deeply. So in this case, the collection was amassed. But here, the quality of public space was in, was in our hearts. You know, how do you make um, this very large, uh, uh, plaza into a lush, uh, warm environment. The, the, the people of, of St. Louis knew how to use it day one. It was packed with people and has been ever since. Here you can see the cafe with its green roof, shaded terrace overlooking a tank of water that splits, representing the fall line and the edges of the Mississippi River, and then goes out into a long reflecting pool. Um, the, the, the donor of the project insisted that all the sculpture be fully accessible to the public 24-7. Uh, to the point that one that involves water, children started diving and stripping down and diving in. And, and we said, well, do we have to fence it off? And he said, no, no, no. Young people need a job. We'll just hire a lifeguard. And they'll just stand there all summer. <laughs> That's been great. So this is the reflecting pool at the Cafe Terrace with a wonderful mayol um, at the upper reaches. Um, the limestone was quarried within a few miles of the site. It's a way, to, again, to connect people to indigenous materials and indigenous plants and carry the narrative of place. This is where you are in the world. This is why St. Louis is where it is. This is the quarter-mile-long uh, seat wall that starts to make 
um, gathering spots for two, five, 20 people. So people picnic and sort of impromptu uh, use of this as, as site furnishings. Behind the wall is an exuberant uh, display of perennials. This of course is hair, plant, hair transplant phase um, right after planting. Now it's starting to get a little more lush and you start to see the sinuous curve of the polished granite. The uh, stormwater meadow, that's a wet meadow processing all the rainwater of the site uh, linked to a ricky so that as the kinetic sculpture moves, uh, so too are the grasses um, of the stormwater management. You can see the waterfall in the distance in the upper left. Um, this is, again, stormwater management facility, um, a wet meadow in autumn, um, rendered, uh, I hope, beautiful and informative to the public. Um, then there's this just joy of this giant fountain and children uh, running through it all the time. Um, uh, the walls of the, uh, of the old warehouses are represented by, by hedges of evergreen, and then these bosques of trees and shrubs give a very lush horticultural experience uh, for the people enjoying the site. Um, Hudson Yards, uh, I'll use as the, as the community project because it, is, uh, it, it encompasses planning, um, landscape architecture, engineering, um, and uh, a very bold, sort of missing piece of the city to stitch the High Line and Hudson Boulevard parks and the Hudson River parks. So we're really at an amazing nexus of park infrastructure for the city, part of the unbelievable vision of Plan NYC. Uh, 26 acres of train lines, they all have to remain active. So we're building a lid over, uh, over the train yards. The Eastern yards is the piece that we'll discuss tonight. Um, the process was related held an invited competition of three firms um, and we were uh, invited to work for one month. Um, they were very generous. We were paid to work for one month um, and uh, the three firms each submitted and we were fortunate enough to be selected at the end of that month. So again, I've just walked you through the method at City Garden. Um, we're not rocket scientists. We, <laughs> we do our thing and we love to do it, but that is about looking, looking backward and forward at the same time. We used uh, the brilliant work of Eric Sanderson and Markley Boyer uh, here from the Manhattan Project, um, looking at what was the coastline of Manhattan uh, from, from their project, and this would be the eastern yards in this wet meadow and confluence of drainage ways and streams and creeks, and this would be the Western Yards. Um, don't, make, don't let it make you too uneasy. Um, one of the many brilliant things that that uh, book and project revealed was the highly manipulated nature of this unbelievable city. Uh, we then moved forward in time, started to find the beginnings of the rail history. This wet meadow was inhospitable uh, to many uses, uh, so it feels logical that it ended up being a train yard. Uh, highlighted again, you can see the Eastern and Western Yards. The building of the tunnel beneath the Hudson River, linking Hudson Yards to New Jersey, was praised as one of the greatest feats of civil engineering that the world had ever seen, tantamount to the Transcontinental Railroad and the Suez Canal construction. So here you have this unbelievable feat where people could make it from San Francisco to the banks of the Hudson, and then 40 million people a year took a steamship to just get into town. So, the challenge was, as you probably all know, the geology of the Hudson River is very steep and sheer granite, uh, three, 400 feet deep. So it's this steep V of solid rock. Filling that in in the harbor is a pumping, soft, plastic silt that actually moves with the tides. So there's nothing really to tie or ground a tunnel to. So it was Cassatt, the brother of the painter Mary Cassatt, who was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad Corporation, who uh, had a, a, a very bold idea to build a tunnel made of 30, 30 inch wide caissons of steel in flanges, uh, hot riveted together, and advancing this great head shield is the size of the tunnel, moving forward 30 inches. All of these uh, buckets open up, the soil is removed and sent backwards behind them. Um, many people died in building this tunnel. Um, it was kind of a miracle because what he had come up with was that, to make it very, very overly simplified, it basically operates as a suspension bridge between the two anchors of granite at each end. 
So these caissons are hanging together in the silt. So it's, it's supported on all sides. But it was something of a miracle when it was built. This was the plan. And note this square and this square. Pretty remarkable towers. These were the siting towers where every day the engineers and surveyors would align and give instructions for how the great head shield coming from both directions would advance. So they gave for that 30 inches that day what were the technical measurements to make sure that they met in the middle under the river. Really a phenomenal feat and you can see the plan of it heading down. Right here was the first excavation and where they began uh, dropping down equipment to uh, where they actually broke ground. Uh, we started doing more research uh, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Jill Jones' book, uh, Conquering Gotham. Uh, we brought her into the office. She gave us, a, I mean, it was a spine-tingling tale of uh, the, the traffic and rail history of the city, and we thought we need to understand why Hudson Yards is Hudson Yards. So she um, connected us to Hagley Hall, the um, Museum of Industry in Wilmington, Delaware, and this photograph uh, was from research at Hagley, and we noticed in the lower right-hand corner this interesting little square. We're like, what, is, what does that say exactly? Because here's Cassatt with all the gentlemen in bowlers and the drilling rig in the basement of a building that was torn down to be the beginning of the tunnel of Hudson Yards. And there it is, West 32nd Street and 11th Avenue. We thought, hang on, that's in the middle of our site. This becomes really interesting. This is monumental. This marks a major turning point in the history of New York City and uh, an unpre uh, unprecedented event in infrastructure and engineering. So there is the shaft way. This is the eastern yards. These are the diagrams of the rivers below. And there is the path of the tunnel. Not to make anyone anxious, but that is the same tunnel that we all use today. And it's thanks to its um, articulation, it can actually barely move with the pumping silt. You, you have to read Jill Jones' book. It's, uh, it's really um, a cliffhanger. So in the effort to, to human, it is. It's an infrastructure cliffhanger. Don't laugh. <laughs> be kind. I said be kind. No. Um, we started thinking, well, how, what kind of monument would be appropriate? You know, what sort of work of art that might be a functioning work of art? Again, this is our competition from the project, so um, this is looking back in history. But we started looking at, at places where people have wanted to get up a little bit. This project offers you possibly, probably nine opportunities to get up 1,000 feet over the city. But where are you uh, 60 feet? Where are you at a kind of human scale that you can make the effort to walk up and look out? So we looked at these interesting moments in history where you know, the hand of the Statue of Liberty is delivered and people up top waving, figuring out where we're going to put this girl. Um, and so we, we had an idea of building on the history of the siding towers over the spot where the tunnel was begun and wrapping a double helix stair around transparent screens of Corten steel. So you have a material that will decay and change over time, unlike the steel and glass skyscrapers surrounding it. So you have an, I'll call it a human material because of its possibility of decay. Um, you have these uh, gaining translucence and better vistas as you move up and all at uh, ADA uh, disabled uh, uh, ramping. So you could go in a double helix, you can go all the way up, have the vista at the lookout and come all the way back down without intersecting anyone else. So the traffic flow of this thing would be quite graceful. And really rooted in the history of this place Yes, it looks a little bit like a drill, maybe, um, but it has this sighting idea of looking out to Weehawken and remembering this amazing engineering feat of using these two towers to align things. So it became the heart of the design of the project. This is the Combe Pedersen Fox uh, North Tower and South Tower, Elkis Ben Frady uh, retail block in the center. The Diller Scafidio Rimfro Tower, we call it Tower D for now. If anybody would like to finance it, we could probably change that name if you'd like <laughs> something sexier than Tower D. Um, the Culture Shed is here, and then Tower E by SOM. So we wanted to connect to Michael van Valkenburg's beautiful project of the Hudson Boulevard, bringing this street straight through the project and connecting to the High Line right here. So this will bridge uh, bringing that sight line all the way through 
Um, part of the, uh, the suggestions also from the planning department, and Amanda Burden is quite keen on this vista being maintained through the city. And it's a very nice thread to hang on to between three very different parks. Um, the idea of make, using geometry at a very, very big scale to make a memorable public plaza, remember this is over active train lines. All the soil is in this seven foot thick concrete wafer. So again, the engineering, we don't have the luxury of soil here. And it's hotter than the hinges of hell underneath this lid because of all the trains putting out uh, exhaust. So these are exhaust towers, and then a cascade of fountains that enlarge to greet people who are being dropped off in this area and making their way up into the plaza. The tower occupies the center in a fountain, um, and then groves of trees to either side of a small building, not, still not programmed, might be a cafe, might be retail. Um, could be a flower stand, newspapers, but really this is sort of smaller gardens for gathering and then a big public space uh, for the community. The idea that this tower would be a beacon uh, drawing people from both Hudson River Park, um, Hudson Boulevard, and the High Line, and really tell this story in a subtle and elegant way of these, these double spiral staircases making their way up into the night sky. Um, this is a, a rendering uh, uh, of you, we, we had this idea of using um, horticultural techniques of pollarding and uh, shearing, clipping, using a kind of European techniques of maintenance to hold this very crisp edge, but using plants of the same palette of New York native plants uh, used on the High Line. We're also make, making great efforts to find regional materials, regionally sourced stones, um, to have as small an environmental footprint um, as possible with our material selections. Um, then also counting on, you know, reminding people of fall color and the amazing displays of powerful spring blooms and, and looking at the calendar of events in New York and when can we have an impactful horticultural moment. Um, the, the farm I'll run through quickly. It's really a, 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 an oddball piece of our practice. Um, we call it the Conservation Agriculture Studio. We're managing or we have designed uh, over 15,000 acres of American and New Zealand farmland. And the mission there is to take active farmland, rebuild damaged or broken infrastructure for wildlife, water quality, erosion control, reforestation, biodiversity. So at the same time, farming biodiversity and farming whatever agricultural crop is appropriate for the land in the most sustainable way. So we had the good fortune to work on the North Island uh, east coast of New Zealand. These maps show the way, again, the way we think, starting with the cultural landscape of the Natamarihiri. There, was a, there were traces, powerful traces, of the Maori occupation of this land from 1300 forward. The farmed or agricultural landscape, and then to the right, the landscape of restoration ecology. These three things come together in very complex ways. Um, this is the site uh, as we began. Its native ecology is temperate rainforest. You may think this is beautiful. This is an ecological disaster. This is trouble. This beautiful Mediterranean looking, you know, Bahamian island should be bristling with um, the darkest, deepest evergreen uh, native forest. So with it are also, with the loss of the forest is also the loss of wildlife. This is what the native forest should look like, the native bush of New Zealand. These are the f images of early forestry near the site uh, where the train tracks are actually laid right into the forest and the trees removed. This is, uh, typical forestry practices in New Zealand. How they've maintained a green reputation is beyond me. Um, we've been very critical of it and we've put our money where our mouth is. We've been working there for 12 years uh, uh, with, uh, by opening this farm to the public twice a year to really start to be a leader in thinking about restoration ecology in farmland. Uh, New Zealand is 95% farmland, <laughs> so. Um, giving them some other options and ideas. Uh, this is the restoration grade plantings. This, each one of these white pegs is a tree. So just to give you a sense of the sweep of it, pulling back from this one tree that was left, there are a few patches of trees left, but for the most part it was deforested to maximize grazing. Um, pulling back, you see there are thousands of trees in this image, just giving you a sense of the scale. All all of this has been reforested. So we're, we've planted 600,000 trees so far to rebuild the rainforest edge, uh, the coastal edge of the property. This is what it looks like uh, 10 years later. You can start to see the dark, dark green, 
there on one of the headlands. Uh, the next piece of this project uh, was designing and building a wetland that had been drained to the Pacific Ocean, again, to maximize grazing land. Um, if you're a farmer, you can pretty much do anything you, you feel like you need to do, including draining, draining wetlands. So we decided to rebuild this, but rebuild it as an abstract painting, as a painting providing ecological services through very, very close collaboration with ornithologists, amphibians, uh, specialists, ichthyologists, um, this is the design of total drought scenario and high flood scenario. So doing the grading plans, tailoring these islands in the wetland to the needs of specific uh, animals, looking at Roberto Burley Marx uh, to be, take inspiration from his amazing abstract forms, and, and really being intentional about this being an artificial, a constructed landscape faithful to the ecological services that it could provide. Um, but not pretending that it was natural. Um, this is the resulting uh, form. This is high flood uh, stage just after it was planted. Another 80,000 trees on the islands. Um, another piece was reorganizing all the farming, the sheep uh, fencing, cattle operation, and citrus. This is a 150 foot free, this is landscape architecture. I mean, isn't that nuts? Like, <laughs> uh, this is a 150 foot free span uh, steel bridge that we designed with concrete abutments. Um, you know, they were like, who are we going to get to design a bridge? We're like, well, we could try and, and uh, did, but we oriented that bridge on a sacred mountain, Natamanahiri uh, worship this mountain uh, called Mount Taranaki. And so every time the picking trucks and the farmer and the family that owns this property go across that bridge, they, have, they pay homage to this uh, very important cultural landscape in the distance. So in the foreground, um, we've made a large elliptical shape that organizes the citrus blocks, picking truck, turnaround. We started with the mechanics of how does this farm need to work, and then reforested the edge in native trees um, to prevent any erosion. Uh, we also served as the architects on this project. Uh, Nelson Bird Waltz has 10 architects on staff. We have a staff of 35, design, or 35 people, um, and we designed these small service buildings um, all the architecture on the farm. And then there's a series of collection gardens around the house. So even these collection gardens are representing the macrocosm of conservation. So this is a New Zealand native fern collection around a reflecting pool, a lap pool. Um, this is an aerial of the earthworks garden that's an homage to the history of mound building and earthwork moving. We worked very closely with the elders of the Maori tribe nearby. Um, this is a view of that earthworks garden. Um, used as a meditation garden. And then this is the, the last image looking at sort of the, the use of our imprint, designing this outdoor fireplace as a kind of hearth for the family, for their friends, for the farm family. Um, you see the mounds of the earthworks garden in the distance, and then the highly orchestrated and organized uh, cultivated landscape of farming in the different distance with these receding shelter belts that protect uh, the crops, and then the mountain context in the, in the distance. So that's a garden park uh, planning project and a farm project, uh, just to give you a sense of how we operate and what we do and a little bit of our methodology. So um, I'm really lucky to have the busiest man in New York, um, well, in high competition for the busiest man in New York, um, Vin Cipolla, dear friend, uh, come up and have a little bit of a chat. And then we'll have questions if anybody wants to ask me. That was spectacular. Thank you so much. And Thomas is right. We didn't prepare at all. So, um, but, but that's OK, um, as good friends can do. And seeing this presentation, particularly the discussion of Hudson Yards and then the project in New Zealand, is a reminder of that spectacular things can happen. And the, uh, and the uh, discussion of the, of the tunnel under uh, the Hudson River all those years ago, this is mind-boggling uh, piece of infrastructure, development of infrastructure, uh, and that we as a, as a city, we as a nation, are capable of doing these remarkable uh, things, uh, things for the, for, the, for the public good. And so I have to say, and I can, I can be indulged in this with Thomas since we are fellow MAS board members, uh, that uh, MAS has been, along with the RPA, leading the campaign for a new Penn Station. Uh, in New Madison Square Garden to deal with the unconscionable horror of Penn Station. And today, uh, Speaker Quinn uh, came out a few hours ago supporting 
uh, the MASs and the RPAs uh, position to limit the special permit uh, for Madison Square Garden to operate over Penn Station to 10 years so that we can uh, have the opportunity to really uh, look at the development, the redevelopment of Penn Station uh, and Midtown West to create a first class train station, complete Monaghan Station, uh, and, uh, and hopefully also uh, create and deliver a first, uh, first rate arena. There are over 1,100 columns that support uh, Penn Station, um, um, uh, that support Madison Square Garden, that come down onto the tracks and platforms of Penn Station. You can't do anything uh, to fix Penn Station with the garden on top of it. So this was a very important moment. And Thomas's presentation, I think, about spectacular things happening are, a, uh, are, are inspirational uh, for the work that we're doing now uh, at MAS. So um, there are so many ways that I can go. And I did do a little bit of homework. Um, and, uh, but I just really want to lead off with one question that really draws upon your opening essay. Uh, in the extraordinary book, which you all must um, have, of Garden Park, Community, and Farm. I thought about Jane Jacobs in reading uh, uh, your essay, opening essay, Thomas, and her writings in Death and Life of Great American Cities because you talk a lot about observation and uh, beginning with the tangible qualities and inherent energies of a place, which you so beautifully articulated in describing uh, the farm in New Zealand. This is very Jacobs. Did you did you think about this parallel? Yeah, I think I think Jane Jacobs' uh, writing was seminal to the planning department and landscape architecture department at the University of Virginia, where I studied. Um, this uh, this idea of building connections between human beings and their city as the solution to so many of the problems and operating at the level of the individual. So I think one of our challenges with a space this large is to, is to try to create a series of scales. Um, that's where like the canopy comes down low on low seating areas so that you feel uh, sheltered, if you will, from the very, very tall towers. Um, trying to bring that level of humanity for the individual while making a very, very large public plaza uh, in, in scale with, you know, uh, San Marco in Venice, you know, something that's really a sort of living room for the city of New York, a grand open public space at the largest scale and then a place where two people can have an intimate conversation at the smallest scale. Um, by the way, I think that we'll, Thomas and I will probably talk for about maybe five or seven minutes and then uh, I'm going to open it up to all of you. So if uh, you could begin to think about, because we'll have a little bit of time for a few questions, so if you can begin to think about what that question may be. And when you do um, ask a question, if you could say your name first so we can thank you by your name, that would be really, really great. OK, I want to stay with your essay for a moment because, and you just referred to it a little bit um, in how you address the first question. You talk about three pivotal influences along your path toward landscape design. I love this. Growing up on a farm, living overseas, in a design mentorship during your education, but they were all really deeply felt, deeply described examples. So um, I'm asking you to talk about you, which I, don't, you know, I know you don't really want to do, but if you could share a little bit about these with us. Well, that, that's a generous question. Thanks. Um, uh, what Ven's referring to is the, the introductory essay in, in our book. Um, and that was really at Princeton's pushing. They said, I think the reader is going to want to know who you are and Called why. Called Path in Place. Yeah, Path in Place is the name of the name of the article about, you know, how does one come to a life of design? And I, as, a, as a child, I'd always wanted to make buildings and, in fact, studied architecture and fine arts undergraduate, moved to Venice for five years, um, where I worked for an architecture firm in Venice. And it was really there that I had uh, my landscape epiphany, which sounds strange, living on a tobacco and cattle farm in rural North Carolina at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, that your first landscape epiphany would happen in Venice. Um, a place that has none of the things that we consider landscape, or that I ignorantly considered landscape. You guys are much more savvy, so <laughs> you would have gotten it. But it took me a while because I had always thought they were that the landscape were the, the, the mountains, meadows, forests of, of childhood. They were only natural places. And it was living in a city for five years, realizing that all of the hard surfaces are splendidly designed and intentional landscapes. And that's where really the title for the, the sort of nudgy <laughs> title of the talk, Everything Outside the Building, 
is really an effort to make the point that the landscape begins as soon as you leave the building envelope. And for me, living in Venice, I started to realize that the, the, the temperature and light qualities, the reflectivity of canals, uh, the many conditions of weather that you feel uh, so pressingly in Venice, and then all of the hard surfaces of campi and, and piazzas and plazas were all landscapes. And there was a subtlety to these landscapes that um, one could design. And they could be as gratifying and satisfying as the lush parks or, or forests of, of, of childhood. So that's when I applied to do both master's degrees in architecture and landscape architecture afterwards. Um, and then when you add in a passion for horticulture, it's, you know, then you have kind of landscape architecture as, as we practice it. I'm going to stay with the, um, the book a little longer and I'm going to leverage what, and I'm jumping between different things that, you know, I thought about in advance of our talk tonight, but, but to just, to stay with a theme in the book just a second longer, because it does build on what you just said. So you talk about how landscapes affect us. You talk about landscape design and human relationships. Uh, about how the psychological state may become altered passing through a landscape as well as one's perceived relationship to others and to the environment. And it's beautifully uh, talked about in the book. Um, so you, your process really is on this level. And I guess my question was, when I was thinking about that and knowing you and seeing this brilliant work, do you like imagine whole scenes when you think about like chance meetings, new friendships, romance? Is that what's happening when you're, you know, beginning your process and members of your firm? Uh, uh, yes, you, absolutely. Yeah. I had a, I remember a desk crit from a fantastic design mentor of mine, Julie Bargman, uh, who has the firm Dirt Studio and was a teacher at UVA. And she was like, this sucks. And I was like, I know, why? And she said, you don't know who uses it yet. This was in graduate school, and she said, I want you to name 20 people, make up their names, what their relationships are, who they are, how do they use this space, and start to envision what would they need and want to have a satisfying emotional experience here. And I was like, oh, of course. And just, it really helped build that. That was one of those light bulb moments of imagine public space as it is occupied by people that you could almost name or know and start to envision how they would build their emotional response. I think. The, the idea of narrative is so important to me uh, in that emotional response to space because I think when we feel like you know something about a place, you start to, uh, to feel more comfortable in it. It starts to, uh, there's a wonderful article that Robert Polk Harrison wrote about uh, landscape insanity and the idea of, of holding our mental state carefully is, is uh, this sense of connectivity. And I think in a design that has a strong narrative as opposed to just a lot of pattern making, that that story starts to create a sense of connectivity to history, to the future, to the city itself. You know, um, uh, you know, as Michael also said, I mean, I'm a parks person. So for me, uh, I can be, I'm as happy in Central Park as I am in Mesa Verde or Yellowstone because it's kind of for me where I get it all together. It's that, um, that, that, that experience of being in these kinds of places with this deep history, uh, with these landscapes, whether it's a landscape that was created by an architect or a landscape that, that uh, is there because of its natural state, but also maybe in some ways curated. And what's, um, I think, so special and remarkable about the work of your firm and the work that you presented today is the how scale, and, and you began from one place and you ended in quite another place with respect to scale. From, from the small and very special and elegant and exquisite um, private to uh, extraordinarily expansive and broad um, and highly communal because of all the things that had to be considered um, and certainly with Hudson Yards but also in the New Zealand project. So um, from small to large, is there a difference in the way in which um, uh, you, you all think about these things, you all work. Um, there are landscape architecture students here tonight getting credit uh, for being here. Is there a, um, uh, and, you're, and, and that credit is awarded by the way, it's you're getting that credit. The, um, uh, is, uh, we say so, is the, um, uh, is there a different difference in the process? Does it operationalize differently at the firm? It, um, my instinct would be to say, no, it doesn't. We did the same depth of research for a patch of ground that's 25 by 32 as we did for the New Zealand 
project. It's a, it's a deep dive that we take at the beginning of trying to really excavate the kit of parts. Now, it might move more swiftly for a small place than a very, very large property, but there is an idea of using that process to find a, build a meaningful kit of parts, a kit of parts that, that belongs. Um, and so at any scale, uh, the largest project we're working on is Catalina Island. That's 42,000 acres. Um, so it's a very, very big scale of thought, but that understanding the geology, the hydrology, the cultural traces of the past as, a, as rich fodder for a contemporary response. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that has been great with the mandate from Related is that this has to be an absolutely uh, transporting human experience for people coming here. So the idea of art and monumentality and intimacy all operating at all the different scales that you mentioned just now in your question um, brings me back to the first thing I said. It's the kind of project you feel like your whole life has been leading up to because it's, it's using everything that we've ever explored over the past 18 years. Um, uh, we could be talking for hours and I don't want to go into too much detail and obviously we want to open it up. but. On the Hudson Yards project, uh, where you're um, having to create this extraordinary place on top of a, a, a platform, um, could you say a little bit about that? I mean, this is not, you're not able to put a shovel in, right? <laughs> so you've got to create, uh, you've got to create a platform and then do something on top of it. So one would think that would create some interesting challenges. Uh, absolutely, and one of them being, what's the maximum temperature under the lid? Up to 170 degrees of heat right on the, under the underside of the concrete that has soil and roots of trees. So imagine the trees not only would never go dormant in the winter, but the tops would freeze and they would all die. So very challenging horticultural. Um, and I would say that, I mean, we'd never written a contract for this kind of service before. I mean, at City Garden, it was a very big and, and very big budget project, and we did 350 sheets of drawings and coordinate all the engineering and architecture and all that. But we had dirt. I mean, we had the soil of the earth. <laughs> Here it's like you're in a hot skillet over working trains and it needs to be lush and gorgeous. And so thanks to the untold hours of these two and those eight and, uh, and our collaborators of the, the architects and Thornton Tomasetti and I, I you know, unbelievable consultants who are helping us not screw up, but we really weren't prepared for the enormous number of hours of coordinating the simplest thing, like an irrigation line, that in any other park, you just put an irrigation line underground. It's like, whoa, you can't put an irrigation line there. So every inch of this has to be deeply coordinated. It's, it's a kind of Gordonian knot of design. Um, everything has to go through so many different channels, and we, I would say I was completely unprepared for the colossal amount of coordination time that this project is taking, because you, you can assume absolutely nothing. If you want to add a step, you know, to go down to create a little sense of enclosure, it's like, uh-uh, you're going to hit the roof of a train. <laughs> so, you know, everything is, is highly controlled, and so it's taking a ton of creativity to work around all the constraints, and I'd have to say we love that. Like, I love the obstacles, all the obstacles to still do our best to make a wonderful, wonderful space for the city. Um, I want to ask about uh, Plan NYC and resilience planning and all the work that we're doing in sustainability and resilience in New York right now, post superstorm Sandy, but I won't because that's a whole other chapter of discussion. So one last, one last question for me, and then I'm opening up to all of you. You are a visionary in the profession. You're an educator. So what is the state of the landscape architecture profession, and what is the state of landscape architecture education? Um, I, uh, maybe it's, no, no, that's great. Um, I think we're living in a moment of where it's finally the time for landscape architecture to um, take a strong and central place in the discourse of placemaking and city building. I think even tonight, we were asked if we were bringing some plants to show. <laughs> I was like, what? They're like, well, do you need to come early to put the plants out that you're gonna show? And 
I was, my heart started to beat double. I was like, have I prepared the wrong talk for the, you know? And it's, it's as, as hilarious as that is, it's testament to the fact that as a, the public has no idea what landscape architecture is still. My family definitely has no idea. I <laughs> dread the Christmas questions of horticulture and disease. And, I'm like, <laughs> and I say that as an avid gardener, I love my garden in Virginia so much. I work so hard to maintain it and I, and I delight in that. But it's really two different things. The scale at which we're operating, the way we're designing, yet the public still asks, are you bringing some potted plants to your talk at the AIA? So I think that's, that tells you the state of landscape architecture. I think that the schools are doing pioneering work in infrastructure design. It is inherently a hybrid profession. It is inherently a profession that embraces, not shuts out. It's, it's kind of egoless. Um, just, uh, gosh, for any of you who are landscape architects, the worst day of the whole project is the day it's finished. And you stand there with a client and they look at it and they look at you and they're like, so much mulch. And I'm like, <laughs> I know, isn't it just awful? <laughs> and you're just embarrassed and you're like, oh, it's, you wanna die. And then you come back two years later and you're like, wow, that, you spaced everything exactly right. And then you come back five years later and you're like, you know, the meadow is really maintaining itself. We're burning it with fire, like this is going and the number of birds we're seeing. So it's a, it's a profession that becomes more gratifying. And I found practicing architecture, we wanted to get our pictures taken before the dreaded people moved into their office. You know, it's like, we got to take our pictures before anybody comes because the building's going to start its descent. And there was something about the abundance of landscape architecture that appealed to me. And I think it's appealing to a lot of people right now as the vessel for an interest in conservation biology, farm to table agriculture, uh, the quality of living in cities in a dance, an intimate dance and in partnership with planning. Um, we have very strong relationships with civil engineers. Civil engineering done the right way is incredibly hot. It's very sexy stuff. Um, who thought stormwater and sewage could be this hot, but it's really good stuff. Um, and so I think for the pluralists out there, for the people who are willing to work in the messy work of complex systems, it's an incredibly gratifying profession. And with the number of applicants to work in our office and at the schools, applications are rising at the different universities where I'm uh, connected. Um, it really feels like it's the moment for this profession to stand up and say, we're not bringing potted plants, we're talking about narrative, construction, planning, and building good cities. Uh, we need to edit that into a PSA for landscape <laughs> architecture. That was brilliant. Um, we have a few more minutes. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Questions? There yes, Ms. Hawks. <laughs> Is the concrete pad that now exists over the uh, the rail yard, is that flush with the street, A? B, how much can you add to it? In other words, structurally, it, it, can it bear more weight than it does? And C, if the case is yes, you can, how far can you do it and how do you do it? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> The current status is there is a, a building to the south, but the, the yards are currently open air. So the new platform lid will be coplanar, almost, with the high line. So you're, uh, tw how many, 28? About 28 feet up from the high line. So you'll move right into the southern portal of Hudson Yards. And 10th Avenue is on the rise over the next three blocks. So Hudson Yards, our project will be sloping down slightly. And so they meet at 33rd Street. So the buildings to the east that are basically, those buildings are in a, unbelievable. It's a giant bridge over the throat of trains going into Penn Station. So it operates as one giant truss spanning over the, the train yards. Um, well, we can build up. This, the average thickness of the lid is about seven feet, so it has a concrete bottom, and then we can put soil, but we can also build up. I mean, it's going to carry a monumental 
work of art in the middle of it. And again, Thornton Tomasetti are miracle makers. They can, it's like they can make any dream come true. Um, just takes a lot of steel. Um, and so, and the, you know, the whole thing is spanning with a few carefully located legs going down between the train, tra threading between the train tracks. Um, so yeah, it's been very eye-opening of how much you can do by building up and, and adding the soil. And boy, I, I mean, I've just said it, but I'll say it again. The, the um, depth of collaboration and all the people helping us try to get this right. I mean, we have a lot of goodwill in our office to try to perform well for this, but we, we couldn't get it right if it weren't for phenomenally talented collaborators. Thank you, Kitty. Right here. How are you handling the, the problem of temperature for? Actually, um, there are ideas of capturing stormwater on the site and condensate water from the buildings and running cool water under between soil and concrete so it can start to dissipate the heat. And we're, we're trying to really close loops as much as possible, bringing our conservation ethic to, to the project. Any other questions? Uh, actually, uh, I have a uh, really bit more of information than anything else. Uh, I happen to be the project architect of the stations that was built underground in the early 80s. And somewhat uh, in answer to the support of this platform, when we designed that area, we made allowances for locations of columns. For the light of us in the 80s, we were just bitching. We were saying, who's going to build in this dump? But uh, true enough, <laughs> uh, true enough, it came. But there are spaces for columns within those yeah. areas. And yeah, and they have been uh, mm -hmm. probably following the spaces right. you left for those. Right, exactly. I'm I'm glad uh, we put those. <laughs> uh, there was also one over here, and then and then this way. Yes. Yeah. Hi. I I just wondered if you can. Oh. Hello, um, I'm Lenny. Don't you feel like Cher? I mean, yes, I do. I got you, babe. I got you too. Um, okay, well, is there any way to use the heat in a capacity of, you know, thermal, you know, heating or energy of any kind? I'm sure you've thought about it. And I always hate this when clients ask me this kind of thing, but. Um, what have you thought? <laughs> well, Serena just said we have a meeting tomorrow morning to coordinate what to do with the heat because there's so much coming out of that site. One of the things we're interested in doing is having our fountains run year-round. Obviously, the trains are running year-round, so if we could capture some of that heat to keep the fountains warm without you know, burning any further fossil fuels, that would be a win-win for everybody. So we're looking... Um, we, we teamed up with Sherwood Design Engineering. You've probably worked with them uh, as well, Lenny. Um, really doing innovative things with energy, uh, minimizing our use of energy and maximizing our retention of stormwater and reuse of stormwater. So um, I will continue to report out on what, what we get to do with the heat, but we're very conscious of it. And um, yeah, it's fun to bring our sort of little eco-warrior ethic to this juggernaut of a project and be like, can't we do something with the stormwater? You know, it's, it's, that's been a really fun, uh, fun conversations with Michael. <laughs> uh, there's a question to my right over here. I, I'm wondering if there's, this is sort of the second time this has been done in New York City. The Grand Central was a massive train yard that was capped and turned into some landscaping in a lot of buildings. Is there, were there lessons learned from that? Some of the, both, both from a design point of view and from some of these technical uh, issues that you're raising? One, um, Probably, and surprisingly, I'm not the best person to ask that question for the following reason. This, this project was envisioned by so many people. I dare not even start the list of, of people within the city who had uh, the idea to develop Hudson Yards after the stadium idea went away. Um, and so by the time we were hired for this project, there was a very strict zoning envelope of buildings, a commitment on the part of a mandate on the city, and then uh, embracing by related to leave over half of the space unbuilt as truly public space, open to the public 24-7. Uh, <clears throat> and so we didn't, uh, 
fight those fights for the zoning and the space making. We were really given an envelope uh, at the beginning. So unfortunately, um, I, I wasn't part of the discourse about how um, Grand Central Terminal might have influenced something like this. Um, there's a heck of a lot less building at Hudson Yards. I mean, it's, it's truly a big, 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 you know, six acre plaza in the Eastern Yards. Oh, there's a question in the back. Yes. Oh, hi. Thank you. <clears throat> I've been enjoying the humanistic aspect of your approach to designing public spaces. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the people that you envision coming to the, the public space at the yards and whether you have any feelings or ideas about how they might be using that space, what they might actually do there. We have... a. Uh, uh, probably a fairly captive audience of millions from the High Line feeding, <laughs> feeding into the yards every year. So, the um, in a way, it's the it's the bridge between three parks that's missing. So I think, and when you look at the people on the High Line, I live just under it on Jane Street. It's it is so packed with everyone. Everyone from all over the world is coming to see this unbelievable park, and so. Um, I think thanks to the co-planar aspect of, of just going up a small ramp into Hudson Yards, a lot of those people will come right into the, into the park. And then people coming down from the number seven, um, it's, it's really amazingly well planned. And again, before we got here. So the, the number seven is being extended right to 33rd Street. And then with uh, Penn Station to the east um, for a little while longer. <laughs> until it gets rebuilt <laughs> um, and then with all the parks to the west so you have um, an amazing kind of mixing bowl of people not to mention the millions of square feet of mixed use that's about to sprout um, around the site so one of the uh, one of the in, in in talking about who will use this and thinking back to Julie Bargman's critique 20 years ago when I was a student of you know who is using the space Related also um, um, suggested that we meet with a woman on their staff, a wonderful woman named Stacy Fetter, and she she w walked us through how they program space in their projects. Um, really, I guess Time Warner is the the main uh, public space that they manage, and uh, she started talking about events and receptions, and you know we started talking about food trucks and, and just how do you start to draw many many different demographics of the city. To this to this area, so I think envisioning who will be there is at the heart of their of their mission, and we get to make a great place for them to come. Is your uh, double double helix Corten Tower still part of the uh, plan? Um, that was our competition entry uh, from which we won the project. The idea has survived of having something very monumental. And one of the things I didn't mention was that we really hoped, and the, the resulting sort of orbital shape of the ellipse was really to make a very large and memorable public space using some big scale geometry that uses a monumental work of art as the gravitational center, the gravitational pull of Hudson Yards. And you could see in the plan, all of the paving radiates out from that one point, so the, and even through the buildings, so that you'd have paving shooting through the buildings. When you stepped out of a store, you would realize you, where you are with relationship to that monumental moment. Um, Related is very interested in and is pursuing commissioning uh, an artist to make the, the monumental object. And so we're in dialogue with Related and the artists and all that, so it's, it's very exciting and will be something they unveil at a future date. <laughs> That was great. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think we are out of time. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, but let's just let me say, Thomas, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Absolutely ben. brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.